William, we are ready. Okay, I'm just trying to go live on Facebook too here. Okay, sure. Uh, you mean you're live streaming it on Facebook? Yeah. Okay, as soon as I get confirmation of that, we'll go ahead. We'll wait for your cue. Yeah, it's it's going, so let's go. Okay, let's go. Hello, everyone. We're a student from the Ability City High School of National Trust University. My name is Ryan. My name is Jason. My name is Sam. My name is Paul. My name is Jude. Rainbow egg with tomato is a common dish in Taiwanese families. Although it is simple to make, it is still delicious. Tomatoes and salt make a rainbow egg has sour, sweet, and a little salty. Rainbow egg with tomatoes is not only delicious, but it is also a healthy food. Because it is a homemade dish. There is always scrambled eggs with tomatoes in many people's memory. Take myself for example. When it comes to scrambled eggs with tomatoes, my mom always comes to my mind. It's because she usually makes it for me. You can also get scrambled eggs with tomatoes a try. Next. Let's talk about the ingredients. Fifth tomato, one. And here, one thing you need, you need to know. Fifth tomato is kind of tomato. It's not mean you need to mix up beef and tomato together. Soybean oil, eight milliliters. Tomato sauce, two teaspoons. Garlic, four cups. Eggs, two. Sugar, three grams. Water, 100 milliliters. Half teaspoon. Next, let's talk about the instruction. Step one: mix the garlic and twist and cut the beef tomato into pieces. Step two: mix the wok and pour four milliliter of soybean oil into the wok. Step three: prep and scramble two eggs and stir left right like right eggs for thirty seconds. And when you finish it, put it aside. Step four, put four milliliters of soybean oil and tomato pieces into the wok and fry them for 15 seconds. Step five, pour minced garlic and 100 milliliters water of water in the wok. Step six, simmer the contents for one minute. Lastly, put eggs, three grams of sugar, and half teaspoon of salt in the wok and mix them together. Then you will get a sour, sweet, purple egg with tomato. I want to talk about sesame paste. My mom usually makes sesame paste as my breakfast during my childhood. It is because I always hadn't got much of an appetite in the morning at that time. Here's how to make sesame paste. Before you make sesame paste, you need to prepare four tablespoons of sesame, 300 milliliters of water, and three tablespoons of rice and two tablespoons of brown sugar. Instruction. First, put all the ingredients in a blender. Second, turn on the blender of one to two minutes. Finally, Put the sesame paste in a bowl and it's complete. This paste is taste a little bit sweet, and when you keep it in your mouth, your mouth will be full of aroma from nuts and rice. It's, con it's full of nutrition, it contains protein and calcium. For those who have lactose intolerance and cannot drink milk, they can make a sesame paste drink and enjoy this instead. Next, 
I'm going to talk about famous popular fast food in Taiwan, Rice Bowl. Rice Bowl is minus breakfast. At first, the minus family makes this rice bowl by the leftovers from the previous night. And nowadays, Taiwanese eat it as breakfast. And we can buy it at breakfast shop or street vendors. It's about to divide twenty dollars in Taiwan City for one rice bowl. And it has a little bit bouncy and full of the fragrance of ingredients. And because of your tail, it tastes a little bit crispy. Then I'm going to talk about ingredients. Sticky rice, two bowls. Your tail, a quarter. Pickle mustard cream, 20 grams. Meat gloves, 20 grams. Dry radish, 20 grams. Eggs, two. Garlic, one cup. Sugar, one teaspoon. Then I'm going to talk about instruction. First, wash pickle mustard cream, dry radish, and salt them with sugar and garlic. And you need to heat your cow. Then scramble the egg and set the ingredient above aside to let them cool. Use rice cooker to cook some rice and smooth it out. Finally, put the ingredient above on the rice and wrap all of them into a bowl. Then you will get a bouncy rice bowl. Next, we are going to talk about fried rice and cold noodle. The instructions of making cold noodle is very simple. First, you need to prepare some cold cucumber shred, cold carrot shred, bean shred, noodles, and some tahini or soy sauce. If you prefer, you can add more things into your cold noodle. Generally speaking, the more things you add, the better the flavor. Second, put all the things into a bowl and stir to mix it thoroughly. At this point, there will be a nice smell because of a tahini or soy sauce. Isn't it simple enough? Why don't you give it a try? According to the legend, the originated from uh, cold noodles was the continuous war in ancient times. People eat leftovers with noodles as a fast food when they are in refuge. After the cold noodles was introduced to Taiwan, the Taiwanese cold noodles, which combined with season sauce and Taiwan oil noodle, was developed. The dish was even influenced by the immigrants of Wichon. So the spicy flavors were developed. Fried rice ingredients. Rice, one to two bowls. Soy sauce, two teaspoons. Oil, two teaspoons. Eggs, two eggs. And a some chunks of green onion. So, add two teaspoons of oil into a pan. Second, mix and and pour it into a pan. Third, add rice. Next, add green chunks, chunk green onion and soy sauce into a pan and stir fry for a while. And you can enjoy your delicious fried rice. Fried rice is a very convenient food indeed. All you need to do is to put all the ingredients into from your refrigerator into a pan and fry them. My father is a master of fry rice. He keeps trying to figure out how to make a delicious special fry rice with the food we have in our refrigerator. Cheese, chili pickle cabbage, tuna, and even sticky tofu. All the food you can imagine can be in my fry rice. The most impressive part is my father trying to make a casserole fried rice with three colored beans. Oh my gosh, 
the most delicious food with the most disgusting ingredients. Are you serious? This is my experience about fried rice. If you are curious about the taste of fried rice, go cooking by yourself and create your own special flavor in your house. Thanks for listening. Do you have any questions? So that's the first part of our presentation. We have three parts. And uh, if there are questions for us, you feel free to unmute your mic and tell us. And if not, you can also type into the chat box. So uh, perhaps we will wait until later to ask to have them ask you questions. So uh, you can uh, move we can move along. And uh, Mr. Cunningham is on his way to school. He was at home. He started the session at home and uh, he will be right back with us in about 20 minutes. But we will continue our session. And next, what are we going to talk about? Still more food, more quick food from Taiwan. I'm Sophia. I'm Gary. I'm Joey. Origins of which can be traced back to the Jin Dynasty. The Hakka people were suffering from several wars and have been in Korea for times. On the way to escape, they fry the whole grains and put them into bags. When they go hungry or thirsty, they fry the, uh, put the whole grains into bowls, ground them into powder, and then soak them in water before eating. This healthy food lay child can satisfy their hunger and quench their thirst. Actually, before the economy got better, the hot pot replaced milk powder with lay cha. In the early times, lay cha can enhance people's relationship when they were making lay cha together. This is an indelible memory of the hot pot. This is how to make additional lay cha. You need green tea leaf 100 grams, sesame 50 grams, fried peanut 50 grams. Rice 50 grams, water 100 milliliters. First, put all the ingredients into a bowl. Second, use a grinding pestle to grind all the content. Third, add water while grinding it until it turns into pulp. And the following is the ingredients of modern lay top. You need to prepare. Green tea leaf 150 grams. That means 150 grams. Rice peanuts 50 grams. Pineus 50 grams. Sunflower seeds 50 grams. Pumpkin seeds 50 grams. Rice 50 grams. Water 100 milliliters. First, use a blender to match all the ingredients besides water. Second, Put the contents into a bowl and add boiling water into the bowl. Third, stir the contents and they size down. You can also add some basil or parsley. There are three ways to enjoy leisha. One is to enjoy the trad traditional leisha that was just mentioned. And you can have it with some uh, fried vegetables or fried beans. Another method is to enjoy just only tea, but uh, with no vegetables or fried beans, plus have it with some uh, rice crackers or Chinese cake. The third method is filling the rice into a half bowl of rice, and you can have it with some uh, addition. Next, we are going to introduce egg pancake roll and sandwich. Hello everyone, I'm Hannah. I'm Peggy. I'm Eric. I'm Now 
know my teammates and I are going to talk about two types of common quick food which can be found in most of the breakfast stores in Taiwan. They are egg pancake roll and sandwich. The breakfast store can make with two dishes in just a few minutes since people in the morning are all hurrying to school or to work. First, I'm going to talk about sandwich. There is a variety kind of sandwich. For instance, sandwich with cheese and bacon, or with jam, or with pork, pork broth, tuna fish, or even more. Take a pork broth and the egg sandwich, for example. Here are the ingredients we need. Three tablespoons of pork broth and egg, two cases of white bread, 10 millimeter cooking oil, mayonnaise. Here are both steps to make it in. First, put pork broth on the bread. Second, pour 10 milliliter cooking oil onto the pan. Third, press the egg into the pan and fry it until it becomes sunny side up. Fourth, put the egg and mayonnaise on the bread with pork broth. This is a very fast and delicious food. My grandma always makes it for me to bring to school. And this gives me much energy for class all day. Now I'm going to introduce egg pancake roll. Egg pancake roll of Taiwan is a part of noodle culture that the national government veterans brought into Taiwan. This it was gradually rise back. At that time, Italian pancake first appeared. There was a shortage of food resource and eggs were regarded as the best food to supplement nutrition. So eggs were eggs were added to the Italian pancake. This is the first generation of egg pancake roll. We only need a few ingredients to make of egg pancake roll. The steps are also simple. To make one serving, the basic ingredients of egg pancake roll include one egg, 10 milliliters of oil, one egg pancake wrapping. Now I'm going to introduce how to make it. First, get an egg into a pan and take the pan as we need it for 20 seconds. Next, pour some oil and, and a bacon egg into the pan. And then place the egg cake wrapping on the top. Finally, roll out the egg cake roll and it's done. Usually, we cut it into slice and enjoy it with soy sauce. Here are some common flavors that people enjoy corn, cheese, and tuna fish. Also, there are other special flavors include hot brown, color chips, color protein, and smoked dumplings. In addition, we have a traditional kind of egg pancake roll. It's roasted and similar to this one, but there's a little difference in the ingredients. It has sulfur and we often enjoy this with soy sauce and chili sauce. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? So do we have any questions from anybody, including the audience that are live with us here today? Do you have any questions for the presentation that have just been given? whether it is the first tea with scrambled eggs and tomato or sesame paste and rice ball, or the presentation that was just delivered about cold noodles, fried rice, and lay cha sandwich and egg roll. Anybody with questions from any site is welcome. Yes, go ahead. Oh. And what kind of sandwich, right? For example, in Taiwan, a lot of the uh, 
light sandwiches are eaten at breakfast. Yeah, How the support loss taste because I think uh, in the foreign country they don't have this kind of ingredient. Which ingredient is your pork, pork loss? Pork loss, okay, yeah, you should probably explain more about pork loss, describe what it's made of, and uh, how it tastes, probably the texture. Anybody? So, does everyone know what a pork broth is? In Chinese, it's all no, so. So, so. So, so. So, uh, the question was, how would you explain or describe so, so the other, you know, the students in other countries? Anybody can answer. It's made of pork, right? If it's pork, so it's made of uh, uh, Pork loss is made of pork and what does it taste like in a, or what does it look like? Anybody? I'm pretty sure many people are interested in what pork loss is. Can you try answering it? Is it dry? Is it wet? And what's the can you describe the appearance? Um actually uh, the pork floss is dry and um normally we will put pork floss into our rice and we can eat it with our rice. It's a good ingredient for um to put in the rice and its color is like the brown brown color and it tastes a little a little sweet and also salt is salty and um i think that's all of it okay, anybody want to add anything else to that in the back there's a student that just want to add in that it is soft and it is loose <laughs> and it's salty. Yeah. And as uh, previously mentioned, it is usually added to rice or porridge. Right? A rice ball. Yeah. Any other questions? All we know that the uh, pork noodles has many different types, like Japanese pork noodles or Italian pork noodles. So I want to ask. Oh, right. again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I All we have known that the pork noodles has many different types all around the world, like Japanese pork noodles or yes, Taiwanese pork noodles. So I want to ask that. What's the difference between Taiwanese corn noodles and other corn noodles? Comparing foods around the world. Anybody? You know, did you understand the question? Yeah, we're going to compare the corn noodles uh, in different countries in Asia. Different types of inside the noodles and 
in Japan, in Japan, in, they use noodle to make the sauce, and in Taiwan, we add the sauce to the into the noodles, and we and we have some side dishes like carrot and and cucumber. Yes, but in in Japan, they don't have these side dishes. And they they put the noodles into the sauce and then take it out to be it right. You don't bring the soy sauce. <laughs> Anybody else that is familiar with uh, the these two types of home noodles and would like to add something to that? <laughs> yeah, so they also have this special kind of fish soy sauce that is uh, particular and it's a feature to the Japanese home noodles. And previously mentioned, it, in Japan, they uh, dip the noodles into the sauce and they take it out to eat with the noodles. In Taiwan, it's the other way around. We add the sauce to the top of, you know, like a topping on top of the noodles and enjoy the uh, whole noodles. And the sauce in Taiwan is, um, is quite different, right? It's not soy sauce. It's uh, cream here, I guess. Not very, uh, no, not liquid. Peanut powder. Sesame, yeah, sesame. Interesting. Anybody else? With the previous presentation? Yeah, how? I would like to ask one more question to that. Uh, due to the presentation from the fried rice, we know that. The fried rice all, also add different types of ingredients like tuna or other pork. So I want to ask a question for the other countries people that what is the most ingredients that add in Taiwanese fried rice? You mean fried rice that is different? Uh, in Taiwanese people mostly put what ingredient in our fried rice? Like pork or beef or ham or something like that. Yes, yeah, mostly in Taiwan. Yes. For the presenters? Yes. Okay. So, presenters for fried rice, where are you? Over there, this one? Okay, so what are the most popular ingredients that are added to Taiwanese fried rice? Well, I would say it depends on different family. Like in my house, I but I probably usually put the ham and egg and some tuna into the fried rice and mix it. But maybe in other family, they will put or maybe pickle cabbage, something like that, um, to create different flavors. Okay. So, do you add cheese to fried rice? <laughs> uh, what else do you add to your fried rice? Really? Ketchup? Okay. Eggs? Vegetables? Okay, for vegetarians, just add vegetables to your fried rice. No uh, meat of any kind. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, if we have more questions, we'll wait for the next round. So uh, we will welcome the next team. We will welcome the next team, and you will be presenting on COVID-19. So the next team will talk about the recent situation in Taiwan, the COVID-19 situation. It's a very difficult time for people around the world, and we're all trying to get you know past this misery. And uh, in Taiwan, we are the, you know, we're having, a, you know, we're having better luck. We are working very hard to keep it that way. And we would like to share with you the most recent situation in Taiwan. Okay, you can begin. Hello, everyone. I'm Sophia. I'm Nara. I'm Peggy. I'm Brian. COVID-19 pandemic has been occurring since December 2019. 
This serious epidemic affected not only Taiwan but also the whole world. The influences of tourism was especially obvious. When the first conference case was found in Taiwan, many industries shut down. This phenomenon made the economy slump sharply for a few weeks. For instance, the consumption from people was declining and the unemployment rate was rapidly increasing. This, a lot of workers were unemployed. This led to a crisis in their financial situation and even affected their family. However, the government gave them some financial aid to help them get through the pandemic. Actually, in comparison with 2019, Taiwan's ranking in the world competition increased in five places, and Taiwan's economy is still growing positively. In order to separate affected people from the public, the government carried out a policy which asked people to register travel report. It could help the government to manage the pandemic efficiently. But indeed, it could break our free, personal freedom and violate our privacy. Like the tracking of travel limits, consumption habits, and so on. The epidemic pre prevention measures in Taiwan were praised by many countries. The reason can be traced back to the SARS disaster many years ago. The government learned lessons from the experience and activated the Taiwan Central epidemic command center in the mess. An integrated over 124 measures, including travel limits, border, border measures, screen, and screening. Actually, from November 24th to December 31st, 2020, the people who wanted to come to Taiwan need to provide COVID-19 nuclear acid exception report. However, starting from January 1st, 2021, no foreigner can come to Taiwan. To prevent people from panicking, the administration joined to call a daily press briefing regarding death rule, updating the policy, and confirmed cases. Actually, before after the pandemic got back, the administration changed the daily report to a weekly report. Because of these transparent measures, People in Taiwan won't panic about the pandemic and they won't buy or stockpile the supplies in panic too. Because of COVID 19 outbreak around the world, we try to work out a way to prevent the pandemic spread. A solution is public health research. First, we have sufficient supplies to make sure we are prepared in an emergency situation. And in this part, there are two types of supplies. First, that masterpiece such as toilet paper as well as food, like rice and vegetables. Second, medical supplies. For instance, medical masks, 75% alcohol and bleach. They are all including in our compound to organize the epidemic. Next, the hygiene education is also important. Why is Taiwan can contain the epidemic situation? That is because the people in Taiwan do a great job on personal hygiene. We always disinfect the objects and burn at the end of sight and keep 1.5 meters away from each other when we go where we have. We protect ourselves and others. Beginning from December 1st, people must wear masks in a type of shopping manner. The violation can be up to a maximum of five and fifty thousand dollars. How they care for us. Public transportation, place of confrontation, turning place and sports and specific manner, religious and worship place, interchange or manual, and office and business manner. Nevertheless, the COVID 19 still influenced the ordinary life of people in Taiwan a little bit. At first, people were scared, but quickly the public has confirmed were in place. As a result, People do not pack and buy or pull the bathroom supplies. And ahead of except experience of also met a special reporter to remind people that each person has only one book. And the supplies in demand were well stocked. And there is not no need to worry about running out of supplies. Next price goes from five empty dollars to four 
that are starting on January 1st, 2021. And each person can buy 10 masks every two weeks. Also, the 10 masks will be packed by the factory, and the pharmacist will send it to spend time packing it. There are many kinds of colors and patterns starting for us to choose now. For example, there are red masks with no face on it on Christmas Day. There are also different kinds of masks for other occasions. Now, wearing masks not, not only protect ourselves, but it's also a special thing for us. The mask production now is ran up to 24 million per day. People become aware of this situation. People pay more attention to this crisis. People wear masks when they went out. There are signboards on the doors of all buildings. The sign says that you need to wear masks before you went out. Due to error situation, we are not a, we are fine now. There are over 98 million confirmed cases all over the world. It is still a very serious disease in the world. Next, let's talk about temperature screening and tracking in Taiwan. From my point of view, temperature screening has a big effect on the situation of Taiwan because it exactly checks if a COVID-19 case appears. Take my school, for example, when the virus broke out, when our school takes students' temperature when they enter the school. And if your temperatures are higher, is higher than 37.5 degrees Celsius, the school will register your name and suggest that you see the doctor. And if you go to a public place like airports, post office, you all this, those places only need to take your temperature. The interesting part for me is the time when I'm preparing my senior high school entrance exam. During that time, I usually went to the library to study. Every every time I enter it, the librarian will take my temperature and also ask everyone to write down their personal information like their name, their phone number, and entrance, entrance time. It is, it is actually information to check, to check. Next, let's talk about Taiwan can help. On April 1st, Taiwan donated 10 million bags to our country, 7 million for the Europe, 2 million for the USA, and 1 million for our diplomatic country. From April 1st, Taiwan also donated medical equipment and back to our country. To, solve, to face the serious situation, everyone needs to help each other to solve it. That's all for our presentation. Do you have any questions? Okay, so thank you for the update on the situation in uh, Taiwan regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, and everything that is including all the measures and all the uh, precautions taken. If you have questions for us, uh, re anybody, uh, including the uh, audience on site, you're welcome to raise your hand or unmute your mic and ask them the question now. Anybody from our site? Probably not because we're all in the same country. We're asking the question. We're not see, we're not uh, passing on our information, you know, efficiently. Okay, so any question you have from other sites, you're welcome to type into the message box. If you cannot uh, make your audio function, you know, work. Otherwise, we will uh, continue to you know continue with the next presentation. Anybody have a, anybody have any thoughts against that? No, none. Then we will move on to the next presentation, and we will come back to you later if there are you know questions. And our very last part is a presentation regarding reduced inequality. Hello, everyone. We are students from Affiliated High School of Johnson University. I'm Alan. I'm Sammy. I'm E. 
Today, we are going to talk about sustainable development goals number 10, which is reduce inequalities in Taiwan. Southeast Asia migrant workers are often mistreated and face inequalities. For example, once a nursing worker claimed that she was assigned extra work just because she was in Taiwanese. One of her employers even asked her to do something unreasonable that, that is not in the job descriptions, like throwing away trash or picking up kids. There are a lot of similar experiences that happens to other foreign workers as well. Overtime work, last pay, and racism reminds are common problems. We should all try to reduce inequalities by showing our respects to others and treat everyone equally in order to create a friendly working environment. In addition, discrimination is often appearing in our daily life. For example, <clears throat> our parents often tell us don't get too close to foreign workers or why do you want to do this kind of foreign neighbors. There are not of those to protect them, but people still call them foreign neighbors more often than foreign workers. When we saw that, we, we will look at them with strange eyes, but the fact is we should not. In my opinion, it is the most scary part we didn't realize that discrimination is completely invited in our daily life. To resolve this inequality in Taiwan, we should take some action. For instance, we can give a hand to, to help those who are bullied and talk with them so that they were not alone. And our government should enforce the law to protect the law, to protect foreign workers. In this way, the inequality will be improved and Taiwan will be more beautiful and warm. We hope to provide a friendlier working or study place for everyone in Taiwan. Thanks for listening. Do you have any questions? Okay, so. That part was about inequality, especially toward foreign workers, right? So the people who come to Taiwan to work and uh, hopefully not many of them have this kind of feeling, feeling that they might not be treated you know, equally. And when this kind of situation happens, what are the uh, measures taken here? And so, Anybody want to add anything to that, or do you have any questions about? Yes, Kevin. Uh, how can you do to help these foreign workers go away by yourself? Use your uh, own power to help them. How can you? Do? Without further help, what we should do basic is to avoid racist and talk something bad behind them and treat them equally, just like we treat it to um, everybody in our society. But if you can do more, you can show your uh, friendly to them. And in order to get to know their cultures better. Show our kindness, right? Yes. Okay. Anybody else have you know, an answer to that? I'm going to suggest that we should uh, try to understand more about the culture. So, for example, we have a lot of what kind of countries are the workers? Uh, well, where do the work mostly? Where do the foreign workers come from? Vietnam, Vietnam. I don't know. Indonesia. Indonesia, where? Where else? Thailand. Thailand, China. Anybody else? Malaysia, Malaysia. Philippines. Yeah. So we have mentioned five countries. So maybe we could have more activities or you know, more courses, more games that help us understand their culture and their custom. And then if we understand a culture you know, better, then we won't have you know, these misconceptions or we won't be you know, treating them unfairly. 
right? It would be less likely that that these things, these kind of things, will happen, right? Right. So maybe we should have more cultural, intercultural activities to, you know, try to reduce the uh, chances of you know inequality or uh, you know other misconceptions from happening. Yeah. Any other suggestions? Okay. So that's a, a good way and good thinking to end this part. Okay, so if there are no other questions, we want to pose two questions regarding quick food right now. And uh, if you could take a look at our slide, we're gonna pull up the slide and the students here, we have looked at the question before. And the question is, well, the statement is, it's not a question. Oh, okay, it's, it's a question. <laughs> Sorry, it's a question, okay? It's not a statement, it's a question. Quick food is a, it's the same. Quick food is an important part in our culture. Okay, so you can agree or disagree. Quick food is an important part in our culture. If you agree, raise your green thumbs up. If you disagree, you can put up your red, thumbs down, okay? So here we see everybody with their green thumbs up, okay? Interesting. Anybody would like to volunteer their answer? Okay, wait, wait. Could you have your green thumbs up, up, still up, holding up? <laughs> Howard, go ahead. Howard, I think the answer is that is actually, I think it's actually a, really is an important part in our culture is that rice ball is the minus purpose as we for the presentation we speak all that rice ball is minus purpose at first and it will show us in ancient Taiwan we have the golden mining or related conductory in northern Taiwan so we can show that we have not all the culture that related to the food that we can show that the rice ball are related to the golden miners conductory and the spring ball egg with tomatoes show that how Taiwanese families cook their daily dinner or them, themselves and also sesame page is a good choice for Taiwanese breakfast all this just that the the dining habits or dining culture in Taiwan is my answer. Okay, so thank you, Howard. So Howard really believes that quick food is an important part in our culture. And anybody else would like to add to that? You can also disagree, right? You say, oh, nah, I don't think quick food is an important part of our culture. We take things slowly. We like to enjoy our meals. Who wants to rush around? You know, it starts rushing from right when you start preparing your meals because it's quick food, it's, it's quick to make. So you start rushing, starting from the moment you prepare your food and then most likely you also eat it quickly too. So anybody else? Yes, Rita? Um, actually, I think that the quick food, um, I don't agree that quick food is an important part in our culture. Um, because a lot of our food is made um, in a long, you need to make it in long time, so you can, um, so the food can be tasted better. And quick food, I think quick food is kind of the Western culture because um, I think the the definition in quick food is like the the food in like the McDonald's or KFC. Uh, but in Taiwan or the, the local Asia, quick food is, um, I think it's not, an, not a main part of our culture. Just like what I mentioned, because lots of our food need to be prepared in a long time. So that's my statement. Okay, so thank you, Rita. Uh, did you understand that? So because Actually, a lot of Taiwanese food or Chinese food requires longer periods of time to cook, you know, to prepare and cook. And uh, in the past, 
probably uh, it's not everything is not so hectic. Everything doesn't you know the speed and your everyday life is doesn't move so fast, and uh, people would enjoy their meals more leisurely. But nowadays, of course, everybody is very busy and it's quick food or some people are starting to relate quick food to fast food. And that's why some of you will agree and some of you will disagree. So it actually depends on how you look at the question in the statement. OK, thank you. So let's move on to the second one and we will end our session today with the second statement or question. Actually, we put it in a affirmative state. Sentence. So it is a statement, and the uh, statement is: quick food is usually or always depends on what you want to, how you want to, you know, interpret this. Unhealthy and high in calories, and high in calories, like junk food. So quick food is always unhealthy and high in calories, like junk food. If you agree, raise your green thumbs up. If you disagree, Raise your red thumb down. So a lot of people here find hey, that you. quick food is not always unhealthy. Yeah, Mike, Mr. Cunningham. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, that's kind of a trick question there. Because yeah. quick, quick, foods aren't always, food. quick foods aren't necessarily always unhealthy, but the the trouble is much of the quick foods that we have, especially for like restaurant foods, are very unhealthy. Uh, but you can actually make quick foods that are very healthy for you. They just don't happen to have as much profit as the unhealthy foods do. Yeah, so Mr. Cunningham has a very good point. Did you understand? <laughs> Could you rephrase? <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to say is that remember the purpose of a restaurant is to make money, correct? And if they can make money and do something quickly, uh, they 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 don't really care about the health necessary so much for it. That's not most of business models. Most of business model is to make money. However, if you're at home, you can actually make very many quick foods that don't take a whole lot of time and are very healthy for you. We choose not to do that because uh, convenience or whatever. I think that molds into your first statement there. Much of that has to do with convenience and prepackaging. But if you are willing to uh, do meal prep or you're willing to do some other stuff, you can make some very quick foods and uh, just pull it out of your refrigerator and realistically not spend any time. Considering a lot of times uh, if you have to go to the store or have to go to a restaurant to go get a takeout, yeah, you have the travel time, time to come back and stuff like that as well. Got it. So Mr. Cunningham would say that quick food is not always unhealthy. Of course, if you make it at home, you can make it healthy. Quickly make your food and make your food healthy. However, the problem is when you go out, you mostly see quick food as unhealthy food, you know, like in fast food, at fast food restaurants, right? Okay. So who would also like to add more to this part? Yeah, go ahead. Quick food is, is not equal to fast food. Uh, I think it depends on which which kind of ingredient you choose or which kind of cooking method you make this food. For example, salad is got really pretty low calories. Interesting point, right? Thank you. And yeah, go ahead. I think quick food isn't always unhealthy because you can use the healthy ingredients that without meat and cook it with healthy methods like steam, oil, and fry. Don't be fry. Hmm, yeah, so it also has a lot to do with the cooking method. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, okay, go. Cool. From my point of view, I don't agree with this statement because the quick food range is much bigger and the junk food is just kind of quick food. And um, and we have a lot of a lot of food is nutritious like salad and sandwich. Okay, yeah. So you think junk food is 
quick food, but you no, know, quick food doesn't always mean it's junk food. Okay, interesting. Thank you for your answer. Anybody else? Do you have a question for Mr. Cunningham? Mr. Cunningham oh, mostly yeah. represents USA, but he can also sometimes <laughs> speak for other countries. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Mr. Cunningham, you were going to say? Oh, no, I, I was just going to try to take off some of my protective equipment so I could talk. And would you like to tell them about, tell the students here about your protective equipment that you are required to wear at your school right now? Yeah. It kind, we, of, uh, kind of, you know, very, you know, a lot of things to us. And we have this mask that you wear. Uh, of course, I think, I think uh, our masks are a little bit different. We don't really have the, uh, uh, the, the, um, medical masks, but we have to wear this mask. And then we have to wear a protective shield uh, around this because, you know, there's a tremendous amount of opportunities to get COVID, especially from distance learning, you know, <laughs> it's a bad joke, but uh, yeah, uh, we probably, if you could pan around to my classroom, then we have these protective for each particular student sit in like a little cubicle. And then if you could also see, they have they have shut down the amount of uh, students that you could have in class. Uh, this classroom would normally hold about 35 kids if we were everybody was uh, in, in school. And now we have to spread them out and they have to be six feet apart. Um, however, uh, I normally never have more than one or two students per class per day. So we have seven periods in the day. So several periods, I may not have anybody. Then one period, I may have a person. Then another period, I may have another person. So it, it's kind of spread out nicely like that. We went down. Um, we went down a week, a week and a half ago, almost two weeks ago. And the last day, we're supposed to have around 3,400 and something students, and we only had 11. Questions for Mr. Cunningham? Yeah, I only had two, yeah. but uh, okay, yeah, 11 in the whole Alan? school. Yeah, we have, we have tons of questions for you. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. So I have a question is that um, before you have mentioned that about only 11 students that go to school, but what I'm wondering is how about the teachers? Do they have to <laughs> go to school even now? Or are they required to go to school? Yeah, they actually go to school. And as unbelievable as this is, and, and Mary would really appreciate this, we have to teach the people at the same time, the people who are in class and the people who are virtual. And we're responsible for the people who are virtual that don't even show up on virtual screens. So. Uh, literally speaking, uh, a lot of people cannot get out of their bed to uh, get to go to virtual. Uh, it, it's, it's a real hard problem. Now, we've been doing this almost a year. You think we'd get better at it. And the difficulty is that the longer you go, uh, the worse it gets. So it is a pretty much, uh, in many cases, a lot of educators feel like it's been a lost year. The problem is it's not just one calendar year, it's pretty much lost last year and pretty much lost this year as well. So it's it's gonna end up wreaking havoc somewhere down the line in people's education. It's a very good question that you asked, but yes, that, that's what they're trying to do here. Uh, Mary can probably tell you, a little, your teacher can probably tell you a little bit about the, uh, they were practicing to what would happen if they had to do virtual there in Taiwan. And uh, it's very difficult to uh, look at uh, a model in which uh, you see virtual and success and also same success as being in the classroom. Uh, imagine you trying to teach yourself English through uh, virtual, it, it, it's hard. Uh, it's much easier to do that in the collective. And for many years, teaching has been in the collective, not necessarily individual. Uh, I do teach uh, not only at Dell Valley, but I teach uh, online for uh, another uh, organization, the University of Texas uh, High School Online. I've been doing it for two years now. 
and uh, they've had they've been very successful in their programs. And uh, I've had many students, uh, probably a couple hundred a semester even, that are that do very very well. But there's still some students who uh, even pay money for the course and still do not, you know, complete the course. So no matter what it is, uh, in, uh, you may have people go to cram schools. Uh, they're in Taiwan. I don't know. They're they're popular in uh, in uh, China and they're popular in Japan and popular in Korea, but people still aren't successful at that. So some people. Education is a very personal thing. It, I don't think you can really force on people, but that's how we've been doing it for so many years. I think this is going to change how we look at education. What do you think, Mary? Well, um, the last part about cram school, yeah, you got that right. And the Asian people like cram schools. <laughs> they find it efficient, and I know, I don't know. It's probably a sense of security with more information packed into their you know, brains, I guess. And so it's a, a popular academic culture, I guess. I, I personally don't think that is very efficient, especially when with the uh, topics that require a lot of critical thinking. But yeah, parents, well, especially, yeah, parents especially think that if their kids are doing poorly, you know, in school, they should definitely send their kids to the cram school. Yeah. Now, the cram school to me is the antithesis of what made edu modern education. Uh, good in the respect that it would give you a lot of content in a short period of time. Now, th the problem being is, and the reason I want to use that as an analogy, the problem being is that that doesn't really transfer really well to virtual. Virtual is more like a Socratic method where you ask questions, you can do like this. Now, we could actually, by doing what we're doing right now uh, and being doing on an international basis, it would be probably more productive than just do a cram school or whatever. Uh, I was in a meeting the other night with some people uh, that were explaining about how certain people felt, but they never even talked to those people. Well, if you, if you can explain to me how the people in Taiwan would feel over a certain political issue, but never talk to the people in Taiwan, I think that's very naive and mm. it, it, uh, of uh, that to do. So I'm thinking that this will open up a lot more opportunities I was kind of using cram school as the, uh, oh gosh, uh, the, I don't know how to say it, you know, but I yeah, look yeah, at the success of a model is kind of past. Does that make sense? Yeah, actually, I, I'm going to follow with that, it, uh, especially a part about, you know, everybody, well, most of the countries, uh, you know, having people staying home, doing the education and also the work as well. And we're focusing on the education part. I would like to point out that, you know, tomorrow your lecture, uh, I actually organized that to be a part of the solution to, well, it's not actually the part of the solution to what you just said, but I actually had that in mind to get more people involved and uh, actively participate, participating and not just uh, maybe keeping the line you know, connected, but not actually participating like in a lot of situations I've heard. Uh, starting in December, uh, no, November, I have organized a couple of interactive video conferencing courses, uh, starting with uh, a speaker from Taiwan, mm -hmm. Dr. William Su, and he led students around the world you know, in discussions regarding climate crisis and uh, especially the aspect of plastic uh, pollution, plastic crisis. And the way that I designed the curriculum was that students around the world would be unmuting their mic if possible to actually contribute their thoughts. And if they have trouble with their audio and uh, cannot use their mic, they can also type into the set the chat box and so with that, we have, you know, a number of students around the world that can actually, you know, you know, they're there because they're participating. Right. And then we have the breakout. Well, I was going to have students in groups, but then uh, we kind of meet halfway. We have the sites mute for like two or three minutes to five, up to five minutes, uh, depending on how complex the question is. And they can think about the answer to a particular problem, a particular question, and then come back with the answer because not all students can 
you know, answer a question right then and there, especially if their language, the English is not their native language. So with that, we had more students who are willing to contribute their answers and are more interactive and actually, uh, you know, the so-called showing up in class. So, right. yeah, so in response to what you just said, I thought that was a good way since, um, well, we're, you know, having it better, you know, the things are, Things are better here in Taiwan. I thought we had the responsibility to keep that kind of sessions going, and uh, we can help organize this. So um, tomorrow, your session would be like that. I'm not sure how many sites we can have at that hour because in the past we usually do it, you know, at hours which are more convenient to the American continent and the European continent. And uh, tomorrow is more Asian and uh, Australian friendly time zones. So uh, we would like to see if we can have many more uh, interactive sites. Uh, if not, we could, we're also, with your permission, we're also uh, having other sites to click onto the link to view later on. Mm. Yeah, that, that's no problem. Uh, the important part, which you're trying to, I guess, try to instill into your students is that education doesn't begin with an E, it begins with a U, uh, you know, yourself. And uh, everyone can learn something. The problem is that in the United States, we're trying to teach everybody the same thing. And that doesn't really work out the, really well. Uh, you can't teach towards the middle as much as you can teach a person to go as far as they can. And in, in, I think it's a, a short story by Kurt Von Donegan. It's uh, Harrison Bergeron, if you, if you guys ever get a chance to read it in English. But uh, what they try to do is they try to... Uh, take the people who are very successful and then uh, handicap them to make everybody equal. And uh, since you guys are so close to the, uh, our, uh, our current president's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, associations with the uh, mainland of a country that you are very familiar with, I uh, realize that you, you cannot make everybody equal. Uh, not everybody is created equal. Everybody should have equal opportunities but not necessarily everybody going to have equal equality, you know, when it comes to it. And equality in and of itself is like a, you, you could say at such a low level, if we made everybody equally rich, we could make somebody, everybody poor, and that's not really necessarily a value. And education should be able, to, uh, Margaret Mead said it, education should be to, to teach people how to think, not what to think. I think Mary and them do a very, very good job in, in trying to give you all kinds of different inputs. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed today on, on the food for thought, but like a lot of times, uh, some of the stuff is like out of our control and people should be able to recognize, you know, the amount of work that you guys do and, and putting together. Uh, I know that I couldn't speak Chinese and, and uh, Mary knows my family actually came from China many, many years ago, like last Chinese people were around 700 AD. But, uh, you know, uh, it, the food and stuff that you that you normally will bring each month it is very similar to food in Iran, uh, food in Afghanistan, you know, anywhere down the Silk Road or fast foods in different parts of the world. Uh, and then much of our, <laughs> just like a lot of our, our Italian food is really Italian that we have in the States and a lot of our Mexican food is not really Mexican and a lot of our Chinese food is not really Chinese. Uh, it's kind of nice to actually note, you know, where, where the foods came from. And uh, one time a couple of years ago, we had to deal with rice and it was really kind of interesting to see how rice had completely changed. We had like about five continents talking and that was really kind of a, a special treat. Or one time we actually they had some people grilling antelope. Remember that one, uh, mm -hmm. Mary, where the, the people had killed the antelope in Africa and they were grilling it. And then all of a sudden all the people ran to the and uh, eight day after the end of the show, it was a uh, was kind of interesting. So, yeah. uh, these are opportunities in which uh, you look back and and you not only get to learn English and presentation skills, but you get to learn uh, interaction with your fellow people, and, that, and that's almost just as important. Yeah, the antelope. Yeah, we uh, that was very impressive because uh, students were going antelope. Are they like reindeer? Okay, so people they are eating Rudolph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, reindeer. And we had one time when we remember people from Louisiana cooked alligator and they had made an alligator. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you know, I, I, there's some 
there are people eating food that you would never suspect. I mean, I, I just don't know how, how, how would the first people ever decide to eat that? It'd be really strange, but I mean, it, it's kind of neat to learn about it, if nothing else. I'm not going to eat antelope anytime soon, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, it, it is very f fascinating to learn. I, I'm sorry I didn't get to see more. We we were kind of rained in today with kind of foggy weather, so it took me a little bit longer to come. To yeah, school. no problem because uh, I sort of ha anticipated such a thing could be happening. So I had lined up quite a few presentations, and they were discussing these issues among themselves, which was good. Also, you know, all in English because they realized people are going to be viewing this later on, so it has to be in English. So that worked out well quite well for them well actually speaking you know uh english uh is very fascinating type of language how do you how do how do you how are you able to teach so many people english so well mary could you maybe tell have some kids discuss how they are picking up english or when do they use it okay so how do you uh try to use the language you know that is normally Thing as a test subject for students, you know, mostly anybody, especially the students who are in the uh, our uh, global education in Taiwan team. Maybe you can answer the question. Do you understand the question? 怎么样可以让英文可以真的用出来? 然后, Mr. Cunningham 觉得, 诶, 我教的学生很多, 其实可以真的, how do we uh, achieve such, you know, how did the accomplishment? Hey, Mary, if they, feel more, if they feel more comfortable in Chinese, have them speak in Chinese and you can translate. Yeah, sure. Okay. Would you like to speak in English or Chinese or both or a combination? I don't know. Hybrid. <laughs> <What the? laughs> yeah, go ahead. I would like to say English. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that we can create more projects that we have. We now have some projects like SDG or the global warming or the Crisis of the earth. I think we can create more, more projects that we can talk more about our culture, not just make like food. We can talk about our clothing or our, or maybe we can talk about the politics or the some problem due to many countries that we all know that Taiwan is a Democratic island. Maybe I can say in this way, but Vietnam is a communism. Yes, communism country. So we can just talk about our government. What's different from our government? Government like this, we can talk more about the issue between us, not just only talk about the culture, the global crisis, or what. We can just talk more about the cultural. And uh, yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm guessing that he's saying that uh, creating more opportunities, especially like through video conferencing, we get students to connect to more countries and you get to work on more uh, topics. So in addition to food culture, we have them go further to uh, global issues and even uh, like politics and uh, like mock trial, like Mr. Cunningham is the project, you know, the uh, coordinator, the uh, program director of mock trial competitions for schools around the world. And tomorrow he will be speaking about this and its role in leadership. So this creates a lot of opportunities for students, you know, to actually uh, express themselves and also exchange opinions. And uh, we've been participating in a number of these, and I encourage them, I strongly encourage them to uh, participate in these, especially you know, you're at, actually live, you know, interacting with the peers around the world, it's authentic language. And that what, that's what gets them, you know, really to be able to really master the, the English language. 
uh, Mary, could, how many students do you have there right now? Okay, so how many students do we have? I think we have about 50 to 60 here today okay, because, <laughs> because uh, it's our winter break right now. And this is my leadership camp. It's a three day camp. Oh, uh, yeah. Night and day, it lasts until uh, almost like we, we have them with uh, all kinds of interesting activities until 10, 11. Sometimes the students are even working way past the hours. And uh, these students are from different schools, different high schools in Taiwan. And they volunteered, uh, well, they, they signed up for this uh, camp. So uh, hopefully they're going to have a fruitful experience from these three days. This is the second day. Uh, okay. Yesterday was day one, today's day two, tomorrow is day three, and you're the opening for day three. <laughs> okay, well, let me ask a couple questions if I could. I'm just totally fascinated. And okay, I'll probably, sure. I'll probably include this in a couple articles I'm writing. Now, yeah. first of all, could you, could you ask them what is their feelings towards communism? I'm sorry. Go ahead. What, Again? Is, what is their personal feeling towards communism? Okay, got that. What is your personal feeling, your personal opinion toward communism? Okay. Wow. Okay. So we have two who are like, yes, I want to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so uh, who wants to go first? Oh, you want to go first? Yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's my my part now <laughs> to do the translation. So uh, what the student just said is that basically uh, communism in the very beginning is supposed to be something, you know, it's supposed to be a good a way to uh, take care of all the people in that area. It's a beneficial for everyone. However, uh, as it developed, then uh, people start to make use of this system and profit for themselves. So then only the very few people are profiting from this kind of system. So that's how it turned into a not so good, you know, system, political system. You want to add to that? Yeah, go ahead. I think it is a good idea. Yeah. So you think it's not real communism that is, you know, being practiced in in China right now? Uh, so it's an ideal uh, political system, but it's not actually carried out. What do you think, Mr. Cunningham? Well, you're not going to believe this, but my computer I was on just was actually asked what he felt about communism, and the computer just went blank. Okay, so I had to get on my other computer very quickly. <laughs> Uh, I'm not so sure, but the, the real issue is that if I did that with 60 kids here in the United States in high school, we would probably get maybe half of our population to say that communism was a favorable deal. They would say it's a favorable deal? Yes. Wow. Uh, we're having uh, some real issues when it comes to education. My next question was going to be, what do they think of socialism? What do you think of socialism? Huh? Oh, 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 o
social studies area. Could you define socialism? They, they want to have a definition. Oh, okay, well, well, socialism is uh, sort of almost like communism, but it, it's what's placated a lot of uh, people here in the West. You know, it may be like England or Scandinavian countries, or uh, it, it's a left and center type of uh, thing where the government controls quite a bit of your life. Uh, a lot of people for many years, I grew up uh, many years ago, you know, communism was, uh, was, was uh, you would never mention communism. If you mentioned communism in, in school, you know, you would be, uh, uh, you could be paddled or whatever. Now, today, it's gotten so much the other side is that, you know, we even have teachers who are teaching that uh, we live in a democratic republic, that democratic socialism is fine, that communism is okay, that, you know, our biggest problem is uh, people within our country or whatever. Uh, I was just wondering if that's being taught like that in Taiwan. Is that being taught or is that actually the people's, you know, personal ideas because it seems like the people are very reflective upon themselves, self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh yeah, uh, it, it definitely, and, and in some cases what I don't understand is that it, we go past that Margaret Mead quote, you know, we're not really teaching people what to think anymore. We're teaching mm -hmm. people what to think. Well, if that's the case, the kids are just mirroring what they are being taught without really thinking about it. A good example would be, if I told each one of those students right there today, if uh, you could get free college or free university, would they would that would that be acceptable to them? Hmm. And, and and they have to accept they have to accept communism. Well, no, 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 <laughs> not not necessarily that. But see, what's happening is they don't. Re okay, uh, let me uh, think about. Uh, let me try to explain a little bit more. In the United States, tuition is so high or so expensive that it costs an average of probably $40,000 a year to go to college. $40,000 a year, right? Money. And so it, the amount of money they, they could borrow at this point could be well over $100,000. And some of them are going to have difficulty paying it out. So free college sounds really good to a lot of people. Well, the problem is just when you get something free, uh, you pay it in taxes for the rest of your life. Now, in the past, what you would do is that you would only pay for your portion. So, in other words, if I went to a restaurant and I bought uh, one hamburger or one, uh, you know, one item, I wouldn't keep on paying that for the rest of my life. Well, for this, quote, free college, they would pay for their education plus their children, you know, everybody else's education until the day they quit paying taxes. Well, the problem is they're going to be paying so much more for free, but they don't really realize that, you know, that, that that's what you end up getting when you get socialism or communism is that you end up getting this quote, it sounds like equal, but it's not really equal at all. You have a better opportunity where it's free. I yeah, just that's a very good that. example. Do what? I, I said that was a very good example that you know, it would be easier to, you know, interpret to the students. <laughs> yeah, interpret, yeah, explain that to the students and see what they think, because I don't think tuition's that high in, uh, in Taiwan to go to school. Yeah, that大学,要去上大学,在美国是非常非常昂贵,就是一年四万块,对不对,40,000,那样是台币多少? Yeah, 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 okay. 去上大学好所以他那个如果我们来讲我们用例子来跟你讲什么是社会主义那所以在美国如果说哈大家要不要免费上大学那就哦耶但是你这个知识下来就是大家就缴一堆税这样这就是社会主义啊那一堆税的意
，耶，他看到 free college， 那就没有想到整个那社会主义它代表是什么意思。好嘞，哎、欸，所以那大家感觉社会主义如何 ？What do you think? Would you like socialism? Raise your green, red, green thumbs. 你要你觉得哎、欸，社会主义可以试试看的。Yeah, we would like we would like to try socialism. You know, I don't know. Try it. If you think so, raise your green thumbs up. If you don't want, no, never. I don't. When I grow up, I don't want to have socialism. Then you raise your thumbs down, red thumbs down. Okay. So did you see that? This is the.、Uh, did you take a yeah? Turn that around. Okay. So let's do go again. Yeah. So you see that, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's、uh, it's very different. That that's very good. That that's uh, actually uh, pretty interesting.、Uh, com uh, it's very fascinating, especially considering that they will become future leaders. That that they are at least learning. Could ask Mary, why why do you think that's the case? Why do you think it's so much different in Taiwan? Or why do you think that Taiwanese students are learning more democratic principles than maybe we are in the United States? Well, I I should take this one. <laughs> okay. Well, in my opinion, I would say because、uh, information is very very transparent here in Taiwan, so everyone knows what's going on. They get to make decisions with informed information, and so when you actually know the truth, you can actually make you know better decisions for yourself and for you know for others. So that's important for leaders as well as you know for people. So here, I I I really think that we are very fortunate here. We are getting firsthand information and accurate information. We even have an institute, well,、uh, a government institute, I would say,、uh, that actually focuses on、uh, finding、uh, you know spotting the fake information and uh, actually uh, putting it, that information out for people to know that this is. You know, fake news. This is false information. Don't try to spread this. This is not right. This is wrong. Don't panic. And that's how we got by with, you know, especially with the COVID-19 panicking part. Because, and you know, at the very、uh, initial, an、uh, initial stage, the、uh, false information, the fake information, the fake news were all exploded. Oh yeah, we still having problems even today. I think Chicago is supposed to be going back in February, and the students are—I、uh, mean, teachers are supposed to report today, and they're still uh, uh, unions are、uh, are protesting, trying to get the、uh, teachers not to go back because they say it's unhealthy.、Uh, so we've been at almost a year in many cases, or in and out, or in and out, or whatever, and、uh, still haven't done anything any different. You know, so I, I don't think I don't think this is a real good way to、um, you know to, to To do much of anything, but anyways, I really do appreciate. I, I did. I wanted to always ask that because I have a lot of respect for、uh, the students there, and it seems like you're doing a much better job educating than、uh, we are currently. And and、uh, I, I hope they realize that they may be the last bastions of democracy in the world. So you know they need to learn as much as they can because、uh, as you'll see it. More and more countries,、uh, the actual freedom to to learn and the freedom of speech is being、uh, very censored. Wow, yeah, that that's really you no know, heavy, <laughs> but it actually gives them much to think about and I'll ponder on. And、uh, I think they will be coming up with more questions for you tomorrow. And okay, so、uh, you, you, they are looking forward to you know having you as a grand speaker. We are、yeah. you know very much interested. <laughs> Well, I, I hope I have some stuff for it. Actually, I, well, I, I'll just tell. I have a, a couple.、Uh, I have some segments of some of your compadres,、uh, some of your friends, that we're going to show from the mock trial、uh, that took place.、Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about racism and and how to end it uh, with a, 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 a racism one. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about this.、Uh, I'm working with a, a movie producer. Actually, we're going to try to make a documentary series uh, about uh, this one particular murder that took place a hundred years ago. I'm going to explain how that impacts, and we'll talk a little bit about、uh, religion and、uh, genocide. So, you know, we're going to talk about how you could actually make a real impact.、Uh, I know that you had this.、Uh, <laughs> A student talking about what you've done with all the neat things about,、uh, you know,、uh, global warming and, and stuff like this.、Uh, 
actually speaking, I, I want to try to do that same type of uh, 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 warmth and feelings towards other things I think that are probably more concerning and, and could end up costing people's lives much quicker. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for that. Thank and you. also, do you, would you like the students to also have the, the thumb, the green and red thumb tomorrow? Maybe you can ask them questions. Oh yeah, I'd be glad to ask questions. Yeah, yeah bring in any thumbs you want to, you know. You know just, I, thumb, I, okay. Mitchell, just put, put it to the side, you know. I can ask questions all day long. I, 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 I'm kind of anxious because last year I haven't been able to ask, ask too many questions. So you guys, will, you, you'll make up for a whole year's worth of not asking questions. <laughs> okay. You know, we, yeah. we got somebody else here, uh, Lydia. This uh, is Lydia Ristia. Yeah, Lydia, Lydia where are you Lydia, are you able to hear us and see us? Hmm. We're just about to end this session, but we would like to say hello to you. And you can uh, view on the, the you know, today's session later on when Mr. Cunningham has it you know, posted. Yeah, I, I had posted live and you can see on Facebook and I'll turn it over that Food for Thought on Facebook and I'll have it up on uh, Facebook on both of them. So we'll have that. Uh, also, yeah, so, will you yeah. resend me that link for tomorrow? Or tonight yeah, somewhere? sure, sure. Okay. Not a problem. So, uh, Lydia, sorry we're about to end this session right now. If you could uh, open up your, turn on your mic and uh, say hello to us. This is uh, from Taiwan, the site that you see with many students. We're the affiliate high school of Zhongxi University. My name is Mei Mei Shi. I'm the uh, English international project coordinator, English teacher as well. And we are having our winter camp, the leadership, the youth leadership camp right now. And this is a very interesting part of our, you know, camp with Mr. Cunningham's Food for Thought. The students have been enjoying this session so much all through the years. And uh, if you would like, you can open your mic. If not, we will be, uh, re we will be convening again tomorrow. Well, my tomorrow, but you know, the same day for Texas, USA, yeah. right? <laughs> right. That was the same day in Texas. <laughs> thank you so and much. Will, yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.